this parable, um, it's kind of a tough one. It provides me with some humility. You know, it's, it's one of those deals where whenever we think we have Jesus figured out, he tells us something like this. What does it mean? Last week, just to kind of recap, last week we, we said we were starting a new series. It's called the Oops series. Uh, the series will primarily deal with what to do when you're caught in your sin, when you're caught in the wrong, because those moments will come. It's also a series dealing with discipleship. All right, two weeks ago, we finished our series over more doc- doctrinal issues. It was our resurrection series, if you'll recall. But over these next two weeks, this series will have to do with obedience and creating Christ-like responses in difficult situations. And of course, our primary text for this series is the one that was just read a few moments ago. Now again, this, this parable, it's not, it's not easy to swallow. It can be even sort of confusing. It's one that I, I have struggled with. Yet, if we grab hold of the truth that is locked within this parable, it can be one of the greatest ways to display Christ amidst tough situations in our lives. In order for us to bring the meaning of this whole parable to the surface, we talked about last time almost deleting the title, the man-made title that's been given to the story, the shrewd manager. So we said, take that away, allow the parable to speak for itself. You know, titles sometimes can, can skew our view of what the story might be trying to say. So put, that, put those lenses away, put our agendas away, and let's just talk. Let's just talk about this parable. Now, if you recall, there's a manager of a rich man's household. He was caught in the wrong. He was caught in his sin, in mismanagement of the rich man's affairs. He was a bad steward. Thus, the rich man called the manager and told him, get your report in order because you are going to be fired. No ifs, ands, and buts. You are going to be fired. So last week, we talked about the first section. We talked about how a godly way of response towards receiving news that you have just been caught. We've been taught and trained by our culture, by society, to respond in in one of two ways. Remember? It's either fight, or what's the other one? Flight, right? So fight or flight. It's either fight it, justify it, you know, justify why we did it, lawyer up, try and grab everything you can on the way out the door, or you flight. You become passive. You hang your head. You say, woe is me, woe is me. I got caught in the wrong. You allow yourself to spiral down in self-pity. Yet if you will remember, there is always, I truly believe, there is always an appropriate Christian response in every situation. In this case, the path of Christ does not say, fight it. And it does not say, flight it. Instead, we are to confess and we are to praise God. So as we talked about last time, the manager, first of all, he never denies what he does. If you notice that in this parable, he never denies what he did. He doesn't fight it. He doesn't try and fight for his job. He just comes to terms with what he does. He says, yes, okay. If anything, he does this in a manner that is confessional. He owns up to what he does. And the second thing he does, which you will see throughout this parable, is he acts in ways to give the rich man a good name, to give his his boss a good name. He praises the owner. He doesn't trash the owner at all. So we'll talk about that more next week. But remember those two things, okay? Now, of course, when Jesus tells a parable, you know, the rich man or the master is typically betrayed as God right? This is something we typically know. And if you will notice in the parables of Jesus, the master in these parables is always righteous in their actions, in his actions. So in looking towards application, when we are caught in our sin, in the wrong, first of all, we're to fess up. Confess it. Confess that we have done something wrong. We are to hollow, there's that H word, hollow the Lord in that moment. 
In other words, you make the Lord the most important thing to you in that moment. You make the choice to, to make God your main concern. You say, in the midst of this messiness I am in right now, I am choosing, Father God, I am choosing to hollow you. In the name of Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit. You say, in the midst of what I've just done, I'm turning to you. Not a lawyer, not my spouse, but you first and foremost. To help me find some type of redemption in this mess. You become completely honest with the Father. This is the very first step that sets you on a Christ-like trajectory towards godly redemption as opposed to acting in ways of the world, the ways of fighting or flighting. You hollow God. You confess. And then once we are hollowing God, we allow him to start redeeming us. By taking this route, we we decide that till this thing is at an end, till we are done with this, we will act in ways that bring glory to God. We are to offer our lives up to him and say that even in our mess, I'm going to show that God is good. Always keeping in mind just how good God is. That God was the one who picked us up at our lowest and brought us into redemption time and time again. He's not worthy even to be blamed, but is worthy of all praise. God wanted to be glorified all. He wants to be glorified all the time. Not just in the good times, but God wants to be glorified even in our mistakes. So those were our two starting points last week, just to kind of recap, get us back on the same page, okay? We are to confess first first and foremost. We are to bring glory to God through it. So that's where we were last week. Today, we have to deal with a word, a word that we typically want to avoid. You see, the hard truth about getting caught in our sin is having to deal with this word. My friends, we have to talk about consequences. Now, in order to start that off, has, has anybody played Monopoly before? Okay, this is, this is a classic game, right? Most of us have played Monopoly. Monopoly, it can be a good game. I, I like it because it's loaded with, with actions and consequences. It's a game that usually starts out fun, and it ends up with, like, somebody flipping the table because they're so angry at this game. You know, people tackling each other, game pieces being thrown at the walls. It's, it's crazy. Maybe that's not with you, but when my family and friends get together, it gets a little bit crazy. Now, maybe you haven't experienced it this way, but I have a story I just want to tell real quick. It was, it was in 2014, New Year's Eve, just about to hit 2015. I remember it was tradition to go over to some of our old family friends' home over in Wink, Texas. Does anyone know where Wink, Texas is? Okay, we have like one person who knows where we It's that small. We have a few of y'all in there. So we went to Wink, Texas, and uh, it, it was just our tradition. You stayed up all night. We played games and everything. Uh, this was the first year I got to bring my wife, so I was excited. And we were bringing our little, we had just gotten a little dachshund, and so she's teeny tiny. And so we were excited. We drive. We get to their house, and, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm taking the dog out like every, you know, it seems like every minute to go to the bathroom and my wife's inside, she's hanging out, and I remember my brother coming up to me, and he's with our good friend Erin, she's one of our childhood best friends, and her fiancé, and they're like, hey, Scott, do you want to play some Monopoly? And I was like, I just kind of foresaw what was about to happen, and I was like, nah, I don't, I don't want, I don't want to play that, and he's, they're like, okay, suit yourself, and so, again, I'm going back and forth with the dog, and I hear some yelling eventually, some screaming and everything, and Suddenly so my brother comes out, and mind you, he's older than me. He's, he's uh, 20, 25 years old, and he has his arms crossed, and he's kind of pouting. And I'm like, what's wrong? And he's just like, Aaron is cheating. I was like, okay. And I was like, are you sure she's cheating? Yeah, she's cheating. And then short, shortly after that, her, uh, Aaron's fiancé comes out of the house as well, big, big, burly guy. He's about 28 years old. He has his arms crossed. And I was like, Gregor, what's, what's wrong, dude? And he's like, Aaron's cheating. And then we have Aaron come out, and she's looking at him, and she's just like, man. And I was like, well, what's wrong with you? And she's just like, 
they don't know how to lose well, you know? And so you have a monopoly, you have, you have a game of, cons of consequences, you, you play your actions, and then you have a consequence of that. And it could be a good consequence. You could get whatever block of land you want, or you could not. You could, you could spin, you could go to jail, but you might have a card that you have pulled earlier, and you could play that. And so it's a game of actions and consequences, positive and negative. A game that it's important to accept the consequences either way or else typically all chaos ensues, tables are being flipped. So consequences. You know, this story, it brings up a good point because consequences are not always negative. Though we attribute the word as being something negative itself, at the heart of the word, consequences are not always undesirable, harmful, harmful damaging, or even unwanted. Let me, let me explain this a little bit. Let me define the word consequences for us. It means this, a result or effect of an action or condition. Simply that. Synonyms for it may be result, outcome, effect, repercussion, ramification. So based on that, based on the true definition of the word, we must almost reframe this word before we can continue on and realize that it does not always mean something bad or negative. In the end, it means the result of doing a type of action. That's it. So my friends, I would suggest we face multiple consequences every day without thinking twice about it. I go to my car in the morning, I open the door, I sit down, I put the key into the ignition, and I turn it. The result of turning that key, the consequence of that action, will be for my car to start. And I would say that's a positive thing. I want that type of consequence, and so I gladly accept that consequence without even thinking about it. We go to work every day, we work hard. The result we expect at the end of the month is a paycheck. The consequence of working is getting a paycheck. I would say that's a positive thing, right? I would say that getting money to pay your bills, buy groceries, have food in your pantry, that's a good consequence. So typically these are examples of consequences that we are eager to accept. We don't even think twice about it. We just accept them. We find it easy. So consequences don't always have to be viewed as negative. They are simply the result of doing an action. And we like results, don't we? I'm, I'm a results guy. I'll just, I'll flat out tell you I'm a results guy. Often our staff here at FCC, we have a tagline that we like to use sometimes. And it goes like this. Do you want to do what's easy or do you want to have results? And typically we're like, yeah, we, we want results, right? I think most of us would agree that results are nice to have in the end. Even if that's not the easiest path to take at the moment. So all that said, consequences aren't always a bad thing. However, we all know too well that they can be. And that is what we need to address today. Enduring the hard and negative consequences. So in dealing with consequences, there are two things, two things that we need to address today. The first there may be negative consequences to deal with. Simply that concept. The hard truth is that when you are caught in the wrong, when you are caught in your sin, even though you chose the path of Christ, you hollowed God's name, you confessed, you, you started acting in good ways afterwards, sometimes you still have to go through the tough consequences. The type of consequences that are not so easy to accept. You know, sometimes you do go to jail. Sometimes you do get divorced. Sometimes you do lose your job. You do lose a friend. Sometimes the consequences are unavoidable. Unless, unless God says no. My friends, we still have to walk through those consequences though. We've been taught We've been taught that God is a redeemer. We've been taught that he is the one that saves us in times of need. That he is a strong deliverer. And I would agree that all of those things are 100% correct. 
All of those things are true about God. But we often distort those things about God and how we view God. And instead of viewing God as this great redeemer, we view him as an escape route when we mess up. We view God as an object to be used to get out of consequences. We mistakenly view God as, you know, the the get out of jail free card. You get a monopoly. But my friends, this is not a game of monopoly. If you land on the go to jail space, you can't just play a card typically and make it go away. Okay, disclaimer, right? In the end, God decides. Sometimes God does say no to the negative consequences. Sometimes God does preserve us from those consequences, true. But with others, he may choose not to withhold them from negative consequences. But in those moments, he does choose to hold them as they walk through it. There is never a 100% guarantee that if you turn to his path, the path of hollowing God after you have messed up, you've confessed, you have praised his name, that suddenly God will zap away the consequences. He could, but you may find yourself in a position of the manager, having to simply just deal with the consequences. So in this parable, you find a man. This man has messed up, right? We we stated that earlier. He has been unjust. He's been unfair in his dealings with the master. He has been caught in his sin and his wrong, and it is before his master. It is before everyone. It's on the front page of the paper. But he doesn't fight it, and he doesn't flight it. He owns it. He confesses what he has done and knows that there will be consequences. In other words, he accepts that there will be consequences, not positive consequences, not getting a paycheck at the end of the day, but negative consequences. He's going to lose his job. So again, the first thing we must understand and accept is that there will be moments you must face the negative consequences of your actions, the negative consequences of doing that wrong, that sin. So that's the first part, okay? The second thing, the second thing that we need to know. When these moments are before us, when they're standing as clear as day before us, and every part of us, parts of us, wants to avoid those consequences, wants to hide, wants to duck and cover, whatever it is, we decide we go to God confessionally with the hope that he'll provide some easy way out or the get-out-of-jail-free card. We must, we must always remember this important truth. That God is not a means to our end. God is not one who we we can go to to skip the consequences. God is not some genie in a bottle we invoke to fix all of our problems when we intentionally mess up. God is not some tool to be used. God is not some object we possess. He will not be controlled. He will not be shaped. So if we are caught in our a mess. What is our main purpose then? What is the purpose of going to God in those times if it's not to get the escape route approach and dealing with our consequences? I believe that in order for us to answer that question, we must start with almost a paradigm shift towards how we even view God. You see, my friends, we go to, we don't go, we go to God in those moments not to, to use God but we go to him to be used for God, as a tool for God. When we walk through negative consequences, God is not a means to our end, but you instead are a means to his. In those moments, we aren't to go God, to God primarily seeking forgiveness. God has already promised forgiveness, my friends. He sent his son, right? He sees us as righteous. He, he gave us the grace of Jesus that covers every single stain. And this is said consistently throughout Scripture. But that does not mean that we will never face negative consequences ever again in our lives. Just because we're believers. God does not, God does graciously forgive us, regardless of the sin, so we don't have to go to God in those moments thinking that we need to somehow invoke him to give us forgiveness. He's given it. So we primarily go to God in those moments so God can use us in those situations. 
So based on that, when you are walking through your consequences, positive or negative, whatever they are, the question we should be asking ourselves is how can God use me in this moment? You admit your mistake, you confess, and then you let God be the Lord of your life. You admit that you have messed up at this point. You have been the Lord of your life, so you hollow the Father. You put him first, and you give him supremacy in your life. And then you ask him, in what way can I be used to give you glory? To bring glory in this mess. Father, I I know that you are not just some tool to be used at my pleasure and my conveniences, but instead I, I am a tool to be used by even you in this moment, even in this moment. Even though I face losing my job, even though I face a divorce, even though I face my greatest struggle I have ever encountered, you are still God, you are still good. Let me bring you glory. Let me praise your name even in this moment. What if, what if that was our prayer? in the moments we face negative consequences. So there's our two steps. First again, accepting the consequences, realizing that there will be some. Though God can intervene, though they may end up being more positive than negative in the end, there will be consequences. And the second thing, asking God to, to, to use us for his glory as a tool for him, not us, for him as we walk through our negative consequences in order to bring him glory in the end, first and foremost. So my friends, joyfully accept your consequences. Be like Paul, the one who was sitting in prison many times, writing letters, accepting the consequences of living for the Lord. Though he would view them as positive while society would view them as negative. Be like Paul. Accept those consequences joyfully, knowing that you can be used by God and for God, even in the messiest of situations, to bring praise and glory to God. Remember that even in those crucial moments of hard consequences, you are a tool for God. God may not take away those consequences, but that's okay. It's okay. Because even so, you can bring glory to God. Amen.